when they asked me if I would do a talk, I decided to do one on watercolor with ink because this is the painting that I have in this show. Um, which, oh, sorry, I need to remember to put it here so you can see it on the screen. Does that work? Not quite. Well, yes. So if you're going to put stuff down, I'll switch to the other Okay, side. probably a good idea. Um, so why use ink with watercolor? I mean, as, as a purist, you know, watercolor is all about shape. Watercolor is about uh, transience, non-permanence. Um, why mess it up with ink? And partly it's because there's some things that are just too hard to do with watercolor, like this little coil of barbed wire in the snow. How the hell am I going to do that with watercolor? Whereas with ink, I just pull out a pen and scribble it, and it's, it's there. Um, another reason for using water, um, ink with watercolor is that you can go much blacker than you can with any watercolor paint. So I wanted the blackest of all possible blacks for that tire coming out of the snow because, um, oops, I should, put, should I put this down now? Okay, so this tire coming out of the snow because I wanted it to completely pop from the snow. I wanted it to be as different from the snow as possible. Um, and of course, once I started using ink for a few things in the drawing, I kept on going. But the challenge with anything you do with ink is not to do too much of it. To let your, let your piece be mostly about the paint, um, but use ink for where you need it. Um, so where do you need ink? Uh, ink is very good for things that have been made by humans. Um, so things where you need straight lines. So stuff like, um, oops, let's see if I can get the hang of this. Do I need to move it? There we go. So um, these boats, all of those vertical mass, those strong horizontals, that would have been really hard to do with watercolor. And those kinds of straight lines are really easy to do with ink. You just sort of press down on the paper and go, ah, and you've got a clean straight line instantly. When I was out at uh, Mare Island doing the, oops, this is not straight, is it? Okay. Uh, doing the cranes. Um, it's possible to do that as a watercolor, as a loose watercolor. But I like the hard edges and the metal stuff of the creams. Uh, looks like I'm going to pull these out of the cellophane so they don't reflect too much. So here's a watercolor that I did on the same spot of the cranes where there was no, no lines, no ink at all. It was just shapes. And that's good, too. Um, but it's a different kind of painting than what I wanted to say when I was doing the inky cranes. Because I wanted that to be about the hard edges and the metal and the, the stuff made by a machine. Generally not. Um, sometimes I'll get a straight edge and I'll tilt it and run my brush along it like that so I can get a straight line. But um, I think if you have a really straight, e a straight edge from a ruler in one part of the painting, you have to have it in lots of part of the paintings. And the way that I paint, it looks better if I don't have quite so many straight edges. So I, I trained as a graphic designer in the days before computers. So I learned how to use a ruler and how to make clean ink lines. And I really don't want to do that when I'm painting. I want to just let the motion of my arm. But the nice thing about ink is that ink on a stick or a pen is that the motion of your arm likes to make straight lines. Um, let's just show this here. Um, this is a pen which often likes to leap. Well, it looks like it's decided to leap now. But um, Okay, so just with my bare hand with no ruler, just if I let the resistance of the paper slow me down a lot, I can do a pretty straight line. 
just because that's the way that this tool likes to move over the page. It is. Um, this is a pen called a Pilot Parallel Pen. They come in a lot of different widths. They're basically meant for calligraphy, but they're great sketching pens if you want to have an irregular, um, sort of eccentric line. Oops, sorry, I should be putting this down there. If you want to have an eccentric line and you don't want to pay a lot of money for a fancy pen, they're about $10. Um, I'll, I'll demonstrate later how I use them. I have a question. Sure. So are you recording this demo? Yes, we're recording yes. it. It will be on our website uh, in a couple of days. Yeah. And people who are just arriving, I have a handout in which I've written down all of the, um, the names of, all of everything I'm mentioning in this talk. So here's, um, here's another thing. I don't know if this is going to show up very well. Uh, all of these metal poles on this farm, these are the things which hold the gates open that the cattle come through. It was nice being able to do that with watercolor, with a, a pen, because I could get those straight lines pretty easily. And they could be a little bit blobby. I wanted them to be a little bit rough. but. It was nice being able to get straight stuff. And some of you might have seen this. I just posted on um, Instagram the other day. This uh, bridge in, from Oakland to Alameda. That would have been really hard to do without ink. That's right. In this case, I went in with the ink first and drew most of the structure in ink, painted it over, and then um, added a few more ink lines. And I'm going to talk more about that later, about whether to use ink first or watercolor first. And there's quite different results you can get depending on which way you start. Yes. So I'm using, um, I'm using permanent non-soluble ink that's not going to run when I go over it with watercolor. Uh, there's an entry on that list there of my favorite permanent inks. Uh -huh. Sorry. Did that did, did the mountains come first? Uh, let's see. How did I do that? I think they did. I think the mountains came first. Um, I did most of it first. There, there's a problem when you start off with ink first, that you just want to keep going and the whole thing becomes an ink drawing, rather than having the ink be a supplement to whatever you're building with watercolor. So it's the whole line and shape argument, which I'm sure everybody here is familiar with. Do you see in shapes or do you see in lines? Do you want to draw in shapes? Do you want to draw in lines? And obviously, anything you do where you're drawing with ink, you're heading back towards the lines side of things. And so it's a struggle to keep your watercolor being about shapes and not letting the lines take over. So here's another one of um, on yet? scaffolding in the city. Um, this one, I think I drew most of it first before the watercolor, because I needed the structure to be pretty rigid and pretty determined. This one, I was using a um, some sort of reddish or sepia ink, I think. Or is it still work? Have you been showing us a plein air work? Or most, mostly plein air. I do much better work when I'm out in the world than when I'm sitting in my studio. Um, staring at my desk and deciding that I really need to be doing email and <laughs> wasn't there a chocolate bar in that drawer in the kitchen and all of that stuff. If I'm out in the world, I just forget about all that stuff. For those of you that don't know, Marty is really well known in the journaling circles uh, here in the Bay Area. Okay. Oops, this is upside down. Okay, there we go. So this one... Um, 
I used, uh, here we go, is it straight? Almost. Okay, so this one I used uh, ink to get some blacker black edges on the, the concrete overhead. And I used a pen dipped in watercolor to get a lot of the line work in. Um, this was a pet cemetery in the Presidio when they were building a freeway over it. And I used, um, I used the same pen dipped into acrylic ink to get this orange netting over the top. And obviously that was added last because it had to go on the top. Okay, uh, lots of pens, so I'll talk about that more later. Um, so this is a print of a, of a much larger painting. I think this is just going to be a little wonky. Um, so this one is obviously mostly about shapes and mostly about watercolor running into other watercolor. But I wanted to have some of those ink lines just to define it a little bit and to show that, that this was a building. And for this one, I did use a ruler because I did need those to be a pretty rigid structure that was going to hold up the rest of that loose watercolor where all the shapes were getting lost in the reflections. Okay, so um, that sure. Uh, the weight of the page obviously uh, is the weight of the pictures you've left on the page, but do you use like on the railing? Is that a white uh, ink or white wash? That was resist. I actually used some tape for that. I've got some really thin uh, white artist tape. Um, and I did use a resist for a lot of those really straight edges there. I, I use tape. I find um, masking fluid is hard to use. I, I have a, always have a hard time getting it off. It slows me down. Whereas putting on a little bit of artist tape to do the masking, it's not pretending to be anything other than a hard edge straight line. Whereas I think with masking fluid, you try and want to make it sort of blend in, but the edges are all, always stand out. Whereas if you're putting tape down, it's just a, it's just a machine line. It's just a, a human line, a human built line. And I wanted, again, I wanted that rigidity in this to hold up against all of the loose dissolving reflections. So we're getting to a demo in just a minute here. So that was all using line for um, things made by humans, but, oh, one more thing made by humans. And this is, this one had no rulers involved at all. It was a falling down barn out in the middle of Sierra Valley. And I still wanted the structure to read clearly enough because of the way the structure was collapsing so much. So I did use ink to, to make that structure hold up, but it let me be completely loose for the rest of the painting with that structure holding it up. The hard bit was figuring out how much ink to use in the foreground grasses and not get into drawing grass after grass after grass with a stroke. So when doing something like this, I try and think of the ink as being only for the shadow parts. So I try and look at the, at the scene and think, what are the darkest darks, and only put the ink there. Because the other pull when you're using ink, the other problem is that you tend to get into coloring book mode. You tend to want to outline all the shapes and then paint them in. And that's really boring. <laughs> um, it's much better to think of just using the ink for the dark bits. So I could use the ink for the, the shadow bits in the roof. Um, and in this one, I put in the basis of the structure with ink and then put watercolor over it and then came back in and added some more ink on top. And unfortunately, I didn't let the ink dry completely, so I got this smear of grayish stuff in the sky. Let's 
see if I can get that. Um, which I later covered up when it was totally dry by putting some darker watercolor in. But it is a it is a problem with ink getting it dry enough to go over the top. Sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. If you look at the the painting that I've got in this show, uh, it's got rough edges. I I generally don't mind if my painting gets a bit buckled while I'm working on it. Um, you can always flatten it out pretty easily later if you're using good paper. And I would rather have the flexibility to go off the edges. Um, so long as I'm not in a really windy place, I'm happy to, um, I don't know, happy for it to be a bit messy. So the other thing that ink is really good for is trees. Okay. So when you're drawing with a stick dipped into ink, it's really nice if you're drawing a tree if you can pick up a stick from underneath that tree and do the drawing with a piece of the tree. And you know, probably it really makes no difference, but it feels nice. <laughs> You know, all of this is about catching some wave of feeling that will carry you through the painting in an interesting way. So um, I'll just show a few more samples of different kinds of things with trees that I've drawn with sticks. So here's an aspen. Um, this one, I was trying to use masking fluid, um, which I'm not very good at. You can see that it got all these weird hard edges where I was using masking fluid. But all of the, the branches and the details on the trees and a lot of the leaves were draw, drawn with sticks and with ink. And the nice thing, again, is that once you've drawn that, if you use waterproof ink, you can go over it with a watercolor and not worry about having to paint around anything for your sky. So when you take a, a twig and stick from the tree itself, do you sharpen it in any way? I do. do I sharpen it with my fingernails if I can. And if I can't, um, a potato peeler is actually a really good way of sharpening a stick. Can I add something more to my kit? Yeah. Well, if you're ever um, teaching a, a class full of kids, you really don't want to have them knives to sharpen their sticks with, but they can't do a whole lot of damage with this. So you can just sort of. Can you give the twig back to the tree or keep it? <laughs> <laughs> if it's a very good twig, I keep it. So you can see that's that's not very hard. You can get a sharp edge pretty quickly. And if you're if you have a class full of kids, it doesn't cost you very much to get half a dozen potato peelers and pass them around. So everybody can sharpen their sticks on the spot. Oh, here's another one. So this one I started out trying to do just as a straight watercolor painting, but it wasn't working. The, the tree was so crazy that I had, to, I had to be able to come in with dark black and draw the pattern of the bark and describe the way all those branches were twisting. It, it was just too hard to do with plain watercolor without ink. So I thought I would do a little demo. And um, what I want to show in this demo, let's see if I can, is how drawing with ink, with sticks, is really good for describing Contours. Let's see if I can get this right. So the beautiful thing about these, the trunks of these old junipers, is the way that they curve around, and the, that's described by those lines in the bark. And 
it's such a joy to look at this that, that you want to show that. And, and line is really the best way to show that kind of thing. Here's, here's another one. Just look at the way those deep um, depre depressions, any anyway, the ridges in the bark, just make a beautiful pattern. Welcome. Um, and here's another one which may not come out so well in the overhead. Yeah, I think that's going to be hard to see. But again, it, it, it has these wonderful branches twisting all over the place. And that was the joy of that particular tree that I wanted to show. And the best way to do that was by using ink. So I'm going to try, I'm going to pick one of these now and just do a little demo about how I would draw these ridges in the bark. Uh, these are photographs. These are photographs, yeah. So these were, um, I did a lot of painting on site and in fact I take my, my class up there. Allison, were you in the class last year that we went up there? Uh, where? Oh yeah. The ridge above Fraser Falls, yeah. There's a whole line of these ancient junipers on this ridge above Fraser Falls in the northern Sierra, in the Lakes Basin area. And um, it's a great place to take a class because everybody can nestle in little spots in the rock by their own particular tree. OK, so which one am I going to try and draw? I'll try this one. OK, so paper with ink. People who do you draw with ink, what kind of paper do you like to use, rough or smooth? Smooth. Ellen? Smooth. Smooth. Anybody want to lobby for rough? <laughs> <laughs> I like cold press. Cold press? Okay. Gen generally, what sort of paper do people use with their watercolors? Hot press, no. cold press? Okay, I, we should do a poll. So, how many people like cold press? How many people like hot press? Ooh, not very many hot press people. <laughs> How many people like rough? Every year I think, okay, this summer I'm going to learn to paint on hot press, and it just never works. I don't understand the paper. So, um, so you can actually use quite rough paper with ink, but obviously you'll get a different kind of result. So I've got some hot press here and some rough paper here. And I'm going to use one of my favorite inks at the moment. This is uh, Dr. Martin's Black Star Matte Ink, which I only discovered about a year ago. I don't know how long it's actually been out there. Here we go. I should put this where the camera can pick it up. This is on, on your handout list. Now, the wonderful thing about this is, A, that it's matte. So you know how if you're using ink with watercolor, the ink, because it's got shellac and it will often be kind of shiny and will kind of pop off the top of your page, off the surface of the page. So the, the matte ink won't do that. It'll, it'll get you the deep, deep blacks, but it'll sit down in your watercolor and won't be obvious so much that you're using ink rather than watercolor. The other thing I like about this is that you can go over... Um, so I'm forgetting to put it where the camera can see it. Um, you can go over watercolor that you've already put down, and it will give you thin lines. Usually when you draw with ink over water, dried watercolor, it gets quite blobby. I'll demonstrate some of that later. But this, this ink seems to behave itself better than any other ink I've ever found. So I'm going to draw with this. The other thing I'd like to do when I'm working with ink is to have some clear water that I can dip my stick into to dilute the ink a bit so I can work with pale ink. And I also often have a little pot of half-strength ink. So it's nice to be able to work with a lot of different tonal values in your ink. So I have a bunch of different tools here. Maybe we should vote on which one to use. So I have my kakimori nib. Has anybody discovered this kakimori nib yet? 
discovered but haven't acquired. So okay. Like it's this ridiculously expensive Japanese nib. <laughs> like it costs thirty five dollars. I mean, can you imagine paying thirty five dollars for a pen nib? But I have twice because I lost it once, so I, I wanted it and bought it again. That, that's on your list there. How long um, does it last? I don't know. I haven't had it that long. But it has this, this very large ink reservoir, and it has little slits all around the edges so the ink can come out of it. So you can do lots of different kinds of lines with it. So, okay, here we go on the smooth paper. You can do very thin lines, and you can do, oops, you can do thick lines. And you can see that I'm getting a kind of a rough edge with that. Let's try it on the rough paper. Ooh, definitely getting a rougher edge, and it's skipping. Let's see if I can get those closer together. Okay, so smooth paper, rough paper. Now, I happen to like the, this rough effect of ink as it skips over the rough paper. I use it in a lot of the work that I do, deliberately going for that effect. So if we go back to this one, I wanted those lines to be really rough on that tree because it was what the bark was like. Same with this one. I wanted, I wanted the pen to skip over the page as I drew. I wanted it to be really rough. Here's one that I did on smoother paper. And uh, I still got it to skip a little bit. But it, it was a nice effect, too, on the smooth paper. So as with any painting that you do, with any sort of art that you do, you try and figure out what your materials are telling you that they, what they want to do, and then do what your materials want to do. So let's see. Should I work on rough paper? I'll work on rough paper. So I brought a bunch of different tools here to work with. And I thought we might do a vote. So the choices are, shall I do this drawing with sticks picked up off the ground? So I, oops, I'm sorry, I should put this where you can see it. Should I do this with sticks that I bought in the store? What do you prefer? I like them all, actually. I, I flop around a lot. Sticks from the ground. Sticks. Okay, so here's some sticks from the ground. And, oops, here's another one from the store. So let's have a vote. Sticks from the ground or sticks from the store? store. Okay, sticks from the ground. Okay, and sticks from the store. Oh, I think the ground has it. <laughs> I could, I could, I could switch over. <laughs> right. Everything will come from Amazon eventually. So I don't happen to remember what these exact sticks are like. I just grabbed them as I was running out the door. Oh, the other choice was the Kakimori nib. Anybody want me to do something with the Kakimori nib? No, we'll, we'll just stick, we'll move around. Okay. Um, okay, I'm going to try and do this twisted tree, which you can't see very well in the photo. Um, but there's a wonderful way that these branches are twisting around over with each other. So let's just see if I can capture that. This is um, 140 pounds. 
I did actually bring some Arches 90 pound, which I've been experimenting with lately for sketching, and it's actually pretty good. It, it obviously wobbles more than the 140 pound stuff does, but it's not bad if you want light paper to carry with you. We could look at that later. Okay, so I'm just going to sharpen this a bit. Really soft sticks you can often sharpen just with your fingernails. Okay. So I'm just going to kind of randomly go into this and not try and do a beautiful painting. Now, did you hear that noise, that sort of scraping noise? That's the wonderful thing about drawing on rough paper is that you can use the resistance of the paper to give you a little bit more control over your line. So I'm lifting up at the end to get it thinner. Mm, it's really squeaking there. And I usually keep a piece of paper close at hand so that I can test the mark just before I make it on the page. So I don't start off with the blob. If I were just to go straight onto the page, oh, didn't get much there. Oh, I didn't get a blob. Okay, this Dr. Martin's ink is just great. The black star. If I needed to do a straight line at any point, I can use the resistance of the paper to give me enough control to make that straight. So by dragging it over the paper, I'll move back on this other paper. So you can use the paper when you need to stop and start by just dragging it on the paper. And the nice thing about drawing trees with this technique is that it gives you a chance to feel how the tree grows. I mean, this is sounding a little bit woo-woo, but you can, you can use the drawing of the ink to, to capture the feel of the way that branch must have grown and some feel of the resistance of the wind and the sun and the, the hard rock that it's growing over. And I don't know, it, it makes it possible for me to feel like I'm more connected to the growth of that particular tree. Okay, so I'm dipping this in the paler ink now. And you can see how, as I'm moving over it, I'm and tracing the feeling of the way that tree is moving and growing. And because there's a lot of lines, you don't have to get each one right. So you could just relax and enjoy the movement of that pen over the page, enjoy looking at the feeling of that tree. Yes. I don't know why it took me so long to discover it. I was, I was looking up. I was going to say, this ink has just come out, and then I looked it up and discovered it's been out for five or ten years, and I had just never come across it before. But it's certainly easy to order online. So I'll go back to my smooth paper. Actually coming out with more or less the same in the smooth paper. This was not supposed to happen. It was supposed to look dramatically different. But um, okay, smooth paper here, 
rough paper here. Yeah, I'm getting solider lines on the smooth paper. Okay, so I'm going to dip into my water here so I'll get a really pale line. Sometimes it takes a while for the ink to work its way off. Well, let's combine all the different ones. Okay, so I'll, I'll just combine different tools. This is not going to be a beautiful painting. Okay, it's a demo. So this particular tool is called a, a walnut stick. And again, it's on the list of materials. It has a, a carved nib with a hole in it in the front. And then it has this sort of felt tip on the back. So here we go on the smooth paper. You can see it can get much finer lines than I can get with the stick. But if I turn it on its side, it can also get quite thick lines. OK, smooth paper. Here we go on the rough paper. liking the way the smooth one is coming out. It's interesting that it's getting more blobby on the smooth one than on the rough paper. So you would do this work first and then paint one color over one color? Yeah. And then touch it up with ink afterwards. Part of the reason for doing it first in this case is because this is what this painting is about. This painting is about the roughness of the bark and the way that those trees flow. And doing the ink first at the stage where I've got more control over it is giving me a chance to focus on that and to let the watercolor sort of be subservient. I'll, I'll paint over this when it's a little bit drier. Um, And I'll just go in and, and make some really pale lines next to this. So I'm dipping my, my pen into the water. So I just use the residual ink on the stick. Sometimes you get not, can get nice stuff by going over slightly wet lines and letting the ink bleed down into the wet stuff. OK, going back to the. back to the rough paper. So I always think that you get the character of a tree in the branches. The trunk you use to root it solidly on the ground, but the branches are what tells you what that tree is like. And it's worthwhile paying exact attention to the, the way that that branch is growing. It doesn't have to be in the right place. It doesn't have to be in the right order. You can leave off half the branches. But you do need to pay careful attention when you're doing them, probably more careful than in this demo. So I can see that the branch goes off to the side. And again, I'm dragging the, the stick over the paper to get some resistance. So I can get that angularity where the, where the branch changes direction. The other side of the tool of the walnut. Oh, oh, sure. Good idea. OK. So the other side is pretty much the same stuff that felt pens are made out of. So I'm going to dip it, dip it in the pale ink. And let's just put in some shadows. And you can get the same sort of feel of, of the resistance of this dragging over the page. But if you need to get thick lines at some point, it's a really good way of doing it. 
called a walnut stick here. Made by um, the same people who make walnut ink, or some of the same people. Daniel Smith also makes walnut ink. So this is, is fine to draw with watercolor, too, if you've got a little pot of watercolor. I'm going to dip it in this water so I can... Oh, now it's kind of taking over. Then you can just clean that and soak them out. Yeah. So far it's come clean. But I do try and wash it off right after I use it. Okay, so again, this is the walnut stick. What the hell? I might as well use all possible tools on this one. Okay, the kakimori nib. Um, and I put it in a special nib holder just so I can spot it after having lost the one the last time. So the kakimori nib, let's... So you can get some quite fine lines with it. It doesn't drag over the paper quite as much as the stick did. Okay, so that's my rough paper. Here we go on the smooth paper. And let's do some stuff on this side. And um, the bamboo pen, it's a slightly more civilized stick. It's got a little bit more control than, than the stick you picked up off the ground. But it basically works the same, that you can sweep it very fast or you can drag it to get angular lines that change direction like that. Okay, um, but I want these to dry a little bit before I put watercolor over them. You can um, speed up the drying by getting a paper towel and just blotting it. So you can see where the ink was picked up. Not too much dry ink on that one. Different inks will dry at different speeds, and you just need to know what your ink is using. Oh, yeah, I should, I'll do a fountain pen demo here, too. So, um, has anybody tried this Sailor Fude pen? Ooh, Marcia knows it. It's a, it's a Japanese pen which has a bent nib. And I always take the cartridges out and put in a converter so I can fill it up with my own ink. And it's a little bit temperamental about what inks will work. But on that materials list, I've listed some of the inks that will work in fountain pens. You don't want to use any ink like India ink that's got shellac in it, because that'll clog your pen. But there are a number of inks now that are really well designed to work with fountain pens. OK, so this Fude nib, you can go on the flat bit and get quite wide strokes, or you can go on the edge and get a thin stroke, and you can rotate it as you work. This one I have uh, Lexington gray ink in it, which I just do because that's what I always put in this pen. Does anyone know Suhita Shirodkar's work? Few of you do. She's an, an urban sketcher who uses this pen just about exclusively, and her whole style is generated by the way this pen will work. So I'll pick up the Pilot Parallel pen. This one has quite a wide um, nib for calligraphy. I usually use the narrower ones. 
I think generally you get a more interesting line with dip pens, but if you're out in the field and you don't want to carry ink and don't want to mess around, these, are, these pilot parallel pens will get you a good eccentric line that's not too far off what a dip pen will do. Let's see if I can... You can also run it along the rough paper lightly so it skips along the paper. Okay, I'm going to blot it again and then we'll let it dry a bit and then I'll show you how it performs with watercolor. No, I haven't thought of that. Is it good? I don't know. I just uh -huh. think you can start from what you've got. And you can see another art right. generation. <laughs> Why not? Why not try everything that you possibly can? Okay, so you can see it isn't picking up a whole lot of damping now. It's just picking up a few blobs. Do you find that the watercolor behaves differently on top of this? Or um, not that differently. What does behave differently is the ink. Um, so I prepared a sheet here uh, in which I wrote the names of lots of different kinds of inks so we can do a test to see which ones run and which ones don't and I did this last night so we've got plenty of time to to check and see which ones are going to blur okay I think I'll just use a water brush because I can wipe it off more easily. Okay, so um, I'm going to use nickel azo yellow to go over the top because it's so transparent. Am I getting any bleeding with this? Pretty much not. No, that one's not bleeding either. Nope, looks like the Kakimori blue-green has decided to bleed. I thought that one was permanent, but now we know. Ooh, and this purple is bleeding too. Okay, here we go with the Dr. Martin's Black Star. No bleeding at all. Okay, Yasutomo Sumi ink. This should not bleed at all, too. This has got shellac in it. Oops, oh, look at that. It's bleeding. Whoa, I was wrong. Or I may have picked up the wrong ink, but... Okay, so now we know that's not a good one. Okay, so here's some Dr. Martin's sepia ink. Yeah, I think we're good on that one. Okay, De Atramentis Document Ink. Now, De Atramentis Document Ink is one of those ones that's designed to work in fountain pens. It's, it's a German ink, but readily available from Goulet pens. A lot of the local art supply stores carry it now because I asked them to. But um, we got uh, our chart supplies in San Francisco to sponsor the sketching group which meant that we could go in and say, sketchers need to buy this, 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 and this. And um, so we're pretty well equipped. OK, so De Atramentis Document Inc. It is now on 17th Street, kind of at the border of Potrero Hill and South of Market. I guess it's really Potrero Hill now. They've, they've had to move so many times, but at the moment, CCA is paying their rent, so they should be there for a long time. So an art supply store can now afford to survive in San Francisco. And they're the Swedish people. And they're called archers? Arch. 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 I was a, a graphic designer mm -hmm. and illustrator in the computer for a long time. That was most of my career. And 
I spent all my days in the computer, and at lunchtime, I would walk down to Arches and touch all the art supplies. And think, <laughs> someday, someday, <laughs> I will use you again. <laughs> I will get to I will get to be an artist with my my hands and not this computer between me and the world. And it was true. And so I always feel like I, I owe Arch big time for helping me to hang on to that piece of myself. Okay, um, Doodler is Lexington Gray. Okay, that's not bleeding at all. And remember, I'm going over these all with the same um, nickel azo yellow, which is super transparent. I love nickel azo yellow. Okay, Birmingham Supercell. I bet this one is going to bleed. It is. Ooh, look at that. Wow. So Birmingham Inc. makes some really, really beautiful colors, and they advertise on Instagram a lot. So if you spend any time on Instagram, you've probably seen their ads. And they'll do these gorgeous drawdowns, drawdowns where the ink separates into all these beautiful colors. You know, there's magenta and purple and gray, and it's all moving around just beautifully. But all the ones that do those really beautiful effects are, are water-soluble. They're not going to be something you can paint over with with watercolor. Um, they do have some that are pretty waterproof called Everlasting. Uh, and I, okay, so the Birmingham iron girder up here is one of the Everlasting ones, and that one didn't lift up at all. But it looks like the Atlantic seaweed did a little bit. They have such great names, too. Okay, Daniel Smith Walnut Ink. I bet you this one's going to bleed. Ooh, look at that. Beautiful color in the bleed but that's not something you could paint over with watercolor. Birmingham gooseberry, I bet that's going to bleed too. Ooh, yes. OK, Noodler's Rome Burning. Now that is interesting, because I think of Noodler's Rome Burning as a real bleeding color, but it must have set itself overnight. I have done some paintings where I've used Noodler's, I've drawn with it into wet or damp paper, and it's bled out in several interesting colors. Because sometimes you want an ink that's going to bleed, because you want that particular effect. But it's really interesting that it didn't, didn't bleed out here. Is it called Rome Burning? Rome Burning, yeah. <laughs> it kind of looks like a, a tarnished Roman coin. OK, so here we've got. Um, an ink which I just bought because of the, the jar. I mean, <laughs> don't you want that? <laughs> just, don't you see it and just want it? And I hardly use it for anything. You can see it's, it's almost full. Um, it's a still life object. Yeah, it is. And it gives me great pleasure to have this sitting in my desk. You but can always use it as a flask to put the uh -huh. ink in a right, jar. Right, good idea. <laughs> or a paperweight or something. But. Um, OK, so here we go. The Hoshizuku Irato, I think it is. Oh, and it's not bleeding very much at all. Huh, I thought of this one as a bleeder, too. OK, so here we have the official test. I'll put this up the front if you want to check it after the talk. I think um, any of the ones that are carbon-based are going to be like that, because um, carbon-based is basically ground-up charcoal. And humans have been using that for 60,000 years, and it's still not faded. So you know, like that, and, and the ochres, um, any of the, the earth pigments that our distant ancestors used that is still there on the cave walls, they're, you can figure that they're pretty permanent. Um, How are we doing for time? Oops, I should speed up. OK, so while I'm going to give these a little bit more time to dry before we do watercolor over the top. No, it's OK. It, it'll, it'll dry enough while I talk about a few other things. So um, I'm sure that you all, as watercolorists, have had the experience of your test strips looking better than your actual painting. <laughs> 
I don't know what it is, but you know, I do the most beautiful test strips and often because you're more relaxed. I know, I'm more relaxed. I'm putting down the color straight away in one hit. I'm not messing with it. I'm not muddying it. Um, I really like to use um, one of the quinacridone magentas, usually diff different brands. Um, call it by different names, so like Daniel Smith's quinacridone magenta is pretty dull, but Turner's is a lot brighter. Um, I like Daniel Smith's uh, quinacridone rose. It's a really good clean magenta. And you all know, I'm sure by now, that red is not a primary color. So pri the definition of a primary color is one that you can't mix with any other colors, but if you mix magenta and yellow, you get red. Actually, I could show that right now. So here is, I think this is a Hansa yellow. And here's my quinacridone rose, which is a pretty clean magenta. you can see that, but isn't that a pretty good red? Yeah. So by definition, red cannot be a primary color if you can mix it from other colors. But that said, I do have a pyro red in my palette for when I just don't want to mess around. So that's the pyro red. And um, I've also been experimenting with paroline maroon recently, which I don't really need, but it's a, a fun color to work with. Paroline maroon. You know, every so often you've got to mix up the colors in your palette to try and throw yourself off balance. Okay, um, so what I wanted to do here was to show how, what can happen when you draw with ink over dried watercolor. So I'm going to use my test strips here for that. Forgot to bring the ink, which will show it blobbing the most. Uh, darn. Okay. Well, um, I don't know what I'll do. Okay, so I've got the De Atramentis document ink in here, which is waterproof. And I'm going to draw over the top of this. Let's see. Nope, it's not really doing it. Well, I don't know if you can see that what happens is it's hard to get a fine line. The ink, when you're going over watercolor, this is um, smooth paper, this is rough paper. Yeah, there we go. Now, it's, the ink tends to blob and spread out a bit when you're drawing over dry watercolor, which can be a beautiful effect that you can use. But if what you're trying to do is something precise with a lot of fine lines, it's not going to work so well. So let's see how the Dr. Martin's Matte Black Star performs. It's blobbing for a start, but I'm getting much cleaner, thinner lines going over the watercolor. And it's going to be hard to see that on the screen. What are you drawing with on that? 
Uh, I'm using a bamboo pen, and I'm using the Dr. Martin's Matte Black Star. Can we see the container today? Sure. Uh, I'll just hold it up for the room, too. And all of this stuff will be up here later if you want to have a look. Okay. Um, something else fun that you can do But um, the lines are not as beautiful, mm -hmm. and you want, I mean, the, the joy of watercolor is the unpredictability of the medium, the, if, of never quite knowing what's going to happen when your brush hits the page, and all of the surprises and the, the unpredictable things. So you kind of want your ink to be as unpredictable, too. If you're trying to do an exact sketch of something on BART, then maybe you do want to use a micron for something like that. But when I'm doing this kind of thing, like with those curving tree branches, what I really want is a line that has a life of its own. And you can't do that with a micron. OK. Oh, oh here we go. Here we go. I think I brought too many things to show. Um, so for a while there, I was saving my test strips and drawing over the top of them um, with ink. I don't know if you can see this. This is, oh, sorry, it's upside down. It's on an airplane. And this was just a random splotch of paint splotches from another painting. But I was able to use the light bits to define a figure and then paint in a little bit over the top of the test strips. And the, the chaos and unpredictability of those shapes kind of reflected the way I was feeling on the plane. I think it was a six-hour flight. <laughs> Um, anyway, so it's, it's a fun thing to do with your test strips, is practice drawing things over the top. Because, you know, it's just something you're going to throw away anyway, so you might as well have fun with it. Something else that I've done with trees is um, I've, I've done a bunch of painting of scenes which have had wildfires. And if you pick up a charred a uh, stick off the ground that was in that fire, when you dip it into watercolor or ink to draw with, a bit of that charcoal rubs off and gets bound onto your painting with the gum arabic and your watercolor or whatever's binding your ink together. And you get, um, get some really beautiful results. Like this kind of line here, I could never have gotten that with a micron pen. It had to be an unpredictable unpre tool that had a life of its own that would kind of leap off and decide the way those branches were going to go. Would you be able to put a wipe on top of that? Yes. The charcoal will charcoal smear a little bit, but not very much. Yeah. With, with no. Unnecessary. Uh, OK, let me skip all this other stuff. Okay, um, so let's see if this is dry enough to paint over. So why paint over it? This, this looks kind of nice the way it is anyway. The, re the reason that I would paint over it would be to define the tree a little bit more. 
um, to say which parts of it are solid tree and which parts of it are air. So I'll just get some random random brown. very much needed to happen to make that be defined as a tree. And because you've got the structure up there, you don't need to worry about painting carefully. You don't need to worry about painting within the lines. You can just enjoy the way the watercolor is flowing over the paper. Um, I might touch it up with a little bit of granulating paint there. But you can see that none of that lifted up. It stayed really solid in place. And I could put some, put on a bit of foliage. So there you have a watercolor with ink. It all together so quickly. Yeah. yeah. It's crazy, isn't it? Okay, so I don't really need to do the smooth one as well. You get the idea. Um, and I am running out of time here. I'm supposed to finish by what time? I'm not sure. Where's Michael? Michael, what time should I wrap this up? Thank you. I think you're okay till, till an hour and a half, so until Okay, minute. okay, so we got a bit more time. Okay. So, um, some pitfalls and things to watch out for while you're doing this is often it's better not to use black ink if you don't want it to take over. It's, it's often better to dilute your ink and work with gray ink. So I went to Sedona over Christmas and this one was done entirely in ink on the first pass, and then I went over it with watercolor. And mostly I used fairly gray ink, especially for the, the background hills that I wanted to recede more. And you've all probably discovered that if you want a line to look thinner, like if you want a thinner branch, but whatever your brush or tool is, is not giving you thinner lines. If, if you're, you know, the brush you brought with you can't go any thinner, you can optic, do sort of an optical illusion thing of making it look thinner by making it paler. I knew it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I knew it. <laughs> so um, anyway, it, it was useful to have, I decided I wanted the, the shadows to be really black. But most of the rest of this, I diluted the ink a lot to make it a lot grayer. So are the shadows ink? Yeah. So I, I did um, all the shadowy bits uh, with ink first, and then I went over it with watercolor. And the reason, um, the reason I wanted to do it in ink first was because the structures, the shapes, were so strange. And I just I don't come from that country. I don't understand it. It's easier for me to mentally analyze something and understand it if I draw it first. Um, so, so line was easier for me to tackle this particular landscape. I'm not an artist, but I do have a question about that. I, sure. I, I'm familiar with this terrain, and I have some art of this terrain. Uh -huh. And what I notice is when you inked it, it makes it very contrasty. Yes, um, yes. More so than you might see in real life. Right. And, and that's for a purpose, I presume, right? Yeah. Just if, if, the artist, if the artist is intentional, I mean, sometimes it's just accidental. Like, <laughs> this is all I have in my pack. So. If you had done the drawing in pencil and okay. then just right. paint over it, it would have 
the more muted, more soft uh -huh. uh, transitions between the sky and, and the bluff, for example. Yeah. Because you see, it's it's very starkly uh -huh. um, demarked with uh, with the black ink between the, uh -huh. between the sky. Yeah, and probably that was a little bit too much outlining for for my taste. The next time I. I tried to do one of those red rocks the next day. I took a different approach. I used colored inks oh. and tried to use the lines to define the contour of the hill. Um, so I was using mostly red and brown and yellow inks to do that one. And then I just put some watercolor over the top and used the watercolor to define the trees a bit more. So ink is it can be pretty cartoony sometimes. Um, and when I saw these cactuses, I wanted it to be a little bit cartoony because that's what they felt like. So I wanted to outline the paddles and, and draw the needles. But once I'd drawn that, I, I was unhappy. It was too flat and too interesting. So I put a lot of watercolor over the top to mess it up and to, to get the feeling of those half-rotting cactuses and things falling off and the messy ground. So uh, it's another thing, you can, you can modify your, your ink work if you don't make it too dark. You can change your mind halfway through the painting. Here's a case where I did want the blackest of the black ink, because I was going pretty dark with the watercolor in this just sketch of some plants, and I wanted something that would go darker than any watercolor I had could go for those, those little lines. But again, they kind of work in with the, the painting that's already there. They're not, not standing out too much. Whereas if this was all pale, they would have, it would have not been as interesting. It was, it was good having that extra stage of going into the dark. And so here's another one that started out pretty cartoony. And I think I overdid the watercolor in this one. This one I was drawing with a crow quill pen, which is just the, the thinnest, sharpest possible pen you can get. So I could get really, really thin lines. And these lines don't have a whole lot of character. But I, I was kind of, I don't know. I wanted it to be a bit light and playful because they were these uh, seals or sea lions, whatever they were, that were leaping around being very silly. So I wanted a sort of cartoony effect. Um, so anyway, that's what I was trying to do with the super thin pen. Yeah. So your text there, the, the words. Do you have any secrets about specific kinds of brushes? Um, I was just using the same Coquil pen that I used for um, for everything else in it. I Where think is this? this is uh, Fort Bragg, the harbor. I think text can be a trap because your brain wants to go into reading mode and you're trying to keep the viewer's brain in image mode. So you kind of have to try and make your brain see the text just as shapes and even break up a bit. If you really want to read it, you can. In fact, I think I made these too easy to read. It would have been better if I'd left off a few little bits, like, like there was peeling paint. Um, so unless whatever you're doing is about the text, it's better to try and make it a little bit harder for somebody to read it. Oh, and I wanted to show this. So I'm showing way too much, but anyway. I was having a hard time editing at home, going through the pile. So sometimes you'll be out there, and you'll see in shapes, and then you'll see the next one in lines. And it's OK to switch back and forth. So I got to go on um, a Trex expedition up in the Klamath River Basin, with um, where they were training people how to do prescribed burns. I'll put it down. That's fabulous. That's, that's a, like a storybook. I love that. So in this one, I didn't need ink. I could get, 
I could get dark enough with just what the watercolor would do. And I wanted it to be about shapes and I wanted it to be about brush strokes. And if I had put ink on this one, it would not have been nearly as nice. But the next one, I was um, sketching two of the firefighters as they were having lunch. And this was a, a low intensity prescribed burn. So these guys were sitting right in front of a burning tree. And um, they were there long enough for me to sketch them. And you can see here that I'm playing with paler ink and darker ink and moving back and forth. And you know, I was just sitting on a little stool in the middle of the road with flames on each side of me. So it wasn't it wasn't a studio painting. It was it was really being out there. Uh, I don't remember. Maybe ten minutes, yeah. How do you find these spots? I was very lucky. I got it, it was Jack Laws had set up his Nature Journal Club expedition to, to sketch live fire. Uh -huh. Actually Miriam Morrill of the BLM had set it up. And I got invited, so. Um, and I have been to another Trex event since, where I was actually teaching nature journaling. But um, it was very cool. Trex, the Nature Conservancy has this program called Trex, where they train people to do prescribed fire. What is it, is that an acronym, Trex? Uh, Rx for prescribed and T for training, I think. Oh, I don't know, it's one of those dopey names. But a very cool program. It's, if we're going to stop our state from burning up in the next few years, we're going to need to do a lot more controlled burns to reduce the fuel load. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, it's, it's an interesting project. But here's another one. So you can see I was sitting right across the road from this low intensity fire. And so I had to work pretty fast. Um, so I was just going in with a dagger brush and slashing away as fast as I could. And again, this one wouldn't have made sense to use ink because there weren't any hard lines. And the interesting story here was the flame and the blurry smoke. And if I'd used the hard lines of ink on that, it would have detracted from it. Can you talk a little bit about your other teaching work, Lori, where you teach? Well, I haven't been teaching very much since the pandemic because I, I tried online teaching and I didn't like it. Um, and I would much rather be in a room full of people than see what people are doing than, you know, sitting in my room at home staring at the screen. Um, so at the moment, just about the only teaching I'm doing is um, San Francisco State has a, a Sierra Nevada field campus up in the northern Sierra. I've been there. You've been there? My geology work there. Okay. Yeah, How many, has anybody else been there? Right. It, it is heaven. It's just the best place. It's, it's like summer camp for grown-ups, and you stay in these tent cabins and the North Yuba River runs through the camp, and um, the whole area is just fabulously Lake beautiful. Lake Basin, the, yeah, Sierra Valley, all this stuff. So anyway, I teach two five-day workshops up there in the summer. Um, and enrollment is opening on the 9th, and they tend to fill up in the first few days. So if you're interested, um, look up Sierra Nevada Field Campus. Enrollment yeah. up and the wait list fills up also. Right, class. right. And their, their software is completely screwy. So last year I had a 14 person and they signed up 25 people and then they had to tell half the people that they couldn't come after all. Um, anyway, so that's about all, about the only place I'm teaching at the moment. I might, I, I used to teach um, Nature journaling for um, the Nature Journal Club. I'd, I'd substitute for John Muir Laws once a year and teach a class about skies or reflections. Or <clears throat> I actually, before just before the pandemic hit, I was getting ready to teach a class called "It's Not Easy Seeing Green." I mean, that's kind of <laughs> if any of you know Van Morrison, but um, I was going to talk about all the the complicated things involved in mixing green. So hopefully, I'll get back to those again and. I'd even gotten Daniel Smith to donate dot cards, so, but the whole thing stopped. Oh, and then I also teach um, urban sketching classes sometimes, which again, we haven't done since the pandemic. But um, does anybody here know about urban sketchers? Right. It's, it's an international organization dedicated to getting people off of their devices and out in the world and showing the world one sketch at a time. Um, and telling the story of what's out there in the world. And I, I stumbled into this 10 years ago. Um, not knowing that it existed, I set up a meetup group called SF Sketchers, 
with the idea that if I got out sketching every weekend, my art would get better, which was true. <laughs> sketching is wonderful. And it was like stepping out in front of a wave. I didn't realize that all these other things were happening in the world, uh, like urban sketchers. Um, there's a bunch of other sketching groups. Anyway, so the whole thing took off like a tsunami and now has more than 4,000 members. Um, and do you I don't usually go out by yourself, or, or do you I do. I do go out by myself, but body. but I do. I used to lead a, a sketching meetup every weekend, and now there's I don't know half a dozen other people leading stuff pretty regularly. So I don't go out all that often. But I'm hoping after this to dash into town and sketch at the Chinese New Year parade. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll see if I can make it. I, I should hurry up if so I'm going to make that. There's urban sketcher blog. Facebook pages, you can see what right. the range of it. Yes. So you live in Seattle. Yes. Okay, so um, let me hurry through the rest of this. Uh, oh, so another thing that um, ink and watercolor is good for is. Uh, here we go. So situations like this, where you've got. Um, complicated feathers on the birds and the, the way that the tail and the wing sort of reach out is very good for that kind of stick drawing I was doing. And this was an illustration project for a book of photos of bird's nests. So I was deliberately trying to do a drawing style that looked kind of twiggy and was, was drawing this with sticks too. And again, for this one, I had to let the watercolor, the ink get completely dry before I put watercolor over it. So um, this was the size that they eventually ended up um, in the book. So all of these thick, clunky ink lines turned into thin, elegant lines, probably thinner and more elegant than I would have wished. I wish they'd made them a little bigger. But um, if you would like a sample of this, I use these for my cards now, and I've put a sample of bird cards out on the table, and you're welcome to take one at the end. Can you tell us about this book? Oh, it's called Nests, 50 Nests and the Birds that Built Them. And you illustrated all the birds? Yeah, but it's, it's a book of photos of birds' nests, and they just, Chronicle just hired me to do all the little birds. Oh, so there's a little story about the nest and my drawing of the bird, and then the... Did you, by the way, did you study the birds? No. no. I'm so not a birder. Okay. <laughs> I, I go out with real birders, and they're going, oh, two o'clock. <laughs> Sharp shinned hawk, and I'm going, Where? <laughs> Where's the bird? <laughs> and then he's got the binoculars. <laughs> I can't even see, you know, I can't see any of it. Mm -hmm. Are there any good references that you can tell us? For? For uh, Ooh, good question. John Muir's book. Yeah, all of John Muir Laws' books uh, for nature journaling are just great about nature journaling and sketching. Um, okay, let me just see if there's any... Oh, one more thing to show. A um, couple more things. So, okay, sometimes I can't do this. So at the moment, I'll, I'll show you something that's not working, okay, which I'm a little embarrassed about, but I'll, I'll just show you how this doesn't work sometimes. So. At the moment, I'm going to be in a show at Art Gallery with the, the Life Live thing, so I'll be drawing people live in front of an audience. And as part of that, I get to have up to four paintings on the walls. So I had, I had done a good run last year of paintings of people in mar protest marches. So I thought, OK, I'm going to do protest marches again. And I've spent the last three weeks completely choked, like nothing is working. So I'm going to show you one of my paintings that didn't work. So I, I had done photos of. I'd done a live photo, so I had lots of pictures of this woman in various positions as she was speaking passionately. So I wanted to have her be semi-transparent and have all the people behind her. And so I did all the ink drawing. Well, no, I did the I did the ink drawing of her first, and then I did the background running through, and then I decided it needed to be more solid, so I painted her in and completely lost all the nice delicacy that had been there before. And so now I'm probably going to pitch it. But it was. Can you pitch it in my direction? <laughs> <laughs> anyway. I, why, why do you think it doesn't work? I, I like it. it what, what would you change? Well, um, oh, 
So like I ended up doing five figures because I'd done four initially and I thought that um, four was too boring so I put in an extra figure and the, this extra figure is just a waste of space. And then there was this beautiful delicate crowd running behind that when I tried to scrape off some of the paint on her, uh, I ended up smearing most of the crowd and losing all of that. And I think it's still fabulous. Yeah. I think it still works. Yeah. I mean, I think. Anyway, so, so that's ink and watercolor doesn't always work. Oh, one more thing. Um, uh, I sometimes just put something under the tap. Um, but I also have, uh, do you know rosemary brushes in England? They're just this great brush maker. They make these brushes called eradicator brushes which are just the best liftoff brushes. They're, they're soft enough that they don't damage the surface of the paper, but somehow they will magically lift up when you've got to lift up. So they're called eradicators. No, I don't know, but you're welcome to come and feel them. So it lifts off the ink? It doesn't lift off ink because I'm using permanent ink, but it'll lift off the watercolor. Wet, what watercolor? Wet or dry? Dry. So it'll go in and, you know, it, it won't pick up the really staining colors like the quinacridones or the Nicolazo yellow are, you know, they're in there to stay, but the earth colors will lift up pretty well. The brand is? Uh, Rosemary and Company. And um, it's this mother-daughter company in England, and they make all the brushes with the women in the village. And they're just the greatest brushes, and even with their shipping, they're really reasonable prices. So it's called Eradicator, if you're into lifting up. Okay, so just a couple more things. Um, there's a coyote on the hill where I live in San Francisco. Actually, several coyotes. And let's see if we can get this. Um, and I wanted the coyote to kind of blend in with the grass and to be sort of kind of there, kind of not there. Um, so this was an obvious one to use ink for because I wanted to I wanted to ha be able to do lots of grass strokes, but I wanted to use the same kind of strokes to draw the coyote. So in this case, I was using, I think I was just drawing with watercolor. I was putting watercolor into um, some of these little pots and just dipping my, my ink pens into the watercolor and drawing with that. So it doesn't, doesn't have to be ink if you want that particular line quality. Uh, where are we? No, I just use them for everything. Just wash off of it. Yeah. Oh. This. Yeah, I was. Um, you know how sometimes you mix too much paint and you end up with this big pool? Um, if you bring a little uh, eyedropper with you, you can suck it up and put it away in these little cups and then use it to draw with later. Do that little thing come like that? Yeah, so the little... And they don't dry out? No, but you do have to be careful to really push down the lids with a click, otherwise they open. Um, so this is on the uh, handout under uh, carrying, carrying ink in the field, right? So another good thing for carrying ink in the field, oh, I'm almost done, um, are these little dinky dip things, which are meant for calligraphers. You can buy them at Arch in San Francisco, or I've listed on the, the handout places you can get them online. And this one, I've, I've put four different inks in here so that when I'm out in the field, I can draw with colored ink if I want to. And the, the amount that this will hold, this little thing, is plenty for one drawing in the field. How do you wash your hands off? <laughs> so it come, they come clean. <laughs> Nails are hard sometimes, but then, then maybe you can shampoo your hair and spend a lot of time with it. <laughs> <laughs> getting it out. Um, anyway, these things are wonderful because they do not tip over. 
and um, the lids seal very tightly so you can carry ink with you. However, because I am paranoid whenever I'm transporting ink in the field, I do it inside a double Ziploc baggie with lots of um, paper towels in the bottom so if there is a spill, it'll soak up in the paper towels. And if it somehow manages to get out of this baggie, this one will catch it. Um, and you know, you always remember to check the, that the tops of your ink bottles are tight before putting them away in your bag. Yes. Yes, always a risk. Um, what else was I going to show? Oh, right, one more, one more thing that I think didn't work. So you would think that ink would be good for rocks, but so I was trying to use ink to do the cracks in the rocks here. But I think there's something that just isn't working about this. It's just too, too tight or too enclosed. I'm getting too much into drawing outlines and coloring them in. So it's one of those things that I almost pulled off, but just not quite. Can that be salvaged? Can you do Possibly. So I'm, I'm hanging on to it, and I, yeah. I'm hoping one of these years to figure out the solution to salvaging it. Would, would you play a diluted ink to redo those outlines? Or? Probably what I would do, I mean, they're permanent, so it's, it's not going to come up. Probably what I would do is come in with watercolor and go alongside the ink to do a shadow so that the ink is the darkest part of the shadow and that it graduates away from it. Okay, one more thing to show and then I'll let you all go. Um, so this is another example of dipping the bamboo pen or the stick into watercolor and drawing with it like ink. So in this one, uh, so in this one, I wanted the background to be pretty blurry, but it was turning out into, turning into a boring painting, so I wanted some highlight activity, and some hard edge stuff in the foreground. So I used the, um, the sticks to draw with watercolor to do all the, the wildflowers and grasses in the foreground. I think it was. Yes. Sometimes, but I'm not very good at it. Someday I hope to get good at it, but mostly I'll try and do something to save a painting and then make it worse than it was before. Um, if, if I set out to do something with just gouache, that tends to work better than going in on top of a watercolor and going, oh, I hate that area, I have to paint it out. And it, it mostly doesn't work. You're better off letting the error just live there. Okay, so thank you all so much. Um, I will uh, help yourself to a bird card, and I will uh, clear off the ink and leave these things in a pile if you want to look at something else.